Time is up. We must now move to questions to the Minister for Agriculture and Rural Development. Again, we will start with topical questions, and I call Mr. David Hildage. Mr. Hildage. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. As the next uh, rural development programme is due to start in January 14, would the Minister agree with me that to minimise delay, reduce delivery, or sorry, reduce delivery delay, and make for a smooth transition? It would be imperative to retain the current clusters and local action groups, or lags as they're known, to get money on the ground speedily. Now, obviously, it will be our intention to make sure that we are able to spend when we have our new allocation of funding. We do not have that um, final amount yet, but um, obviously when we do and um, we have our systems and programmes in place, we want to be able to get that spend out as quickly as possible. You will be aware that I am currently out to consultation on the new programme, and I think as part of that we do have to look at the current structures, how they have worked, if they have been effective in the past. And then obviously learn from um, any examples that, that we can take from that. So that's, that's the job of work over the next number of months, but certainly be my intention to make sure that we spend effectively, we spend quickly, and we have systems in place uh, and practice to be able to go as early as possible. Call Mr. Hildage for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and thank the, the Minister for her answer. Uh, and further to the Rural Development Programme uh, 1420, will DARB be placing more emphasis on the Leader Initiative? to ensure that uh, we take advantage of the higher uh, co-financing rate and thus reducing the finance required through our own national funds? As I said, we are out to consultation and everything is up there. I am very um, open-minded about taking uh, cognizance of all the feedback that we get as, as part of the consultation. I think they are very clear examples of, of, on lessons to be learnt of the current programme and ways that we can improve things. But I am very much wedded to the leader approach. I think that is the, the best method. But as I say, I am very happy to, to listen to, to all the views as part of the consultation. I call Dr Alistair MacDonald for a topical. Thank you very much, uh, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker. The Minister will be well aware of the financial difficulties that arose in the, in the farming community in the result of bad weather last spring and the conditions in a further crisis that ran alongside it. Can she share with us any plans that she has to bring forward uh, various farm payments, like the single farm payment and other payments to farmers, in order to ease the financial circumstances. And can she confirm that all the hardship and fodder crisis payments have already been made? Yes, um, absolutely. I mean, the, 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 the year that, that we've had, um, particularly the start of the year with the snow, was particularly a bad time for the farming community. And then with the, the issue that we had with fodder and the fodder crisis, and having to establish the fodder task force, which, in my opinion, has worked very effectively. Um, it's dealt, at, at the time, we dealt with the initial problems that we had and were able to um, get hauliers and able to transport in um, fodder, which we were able to distribute then to the farming community. That task force has met now four times um, and have agreed that they will meet as and when uh, is required over the next number of months. They have very much been involved in planning for the winter ahead. So, um, whilst we have had a good summer, so we have had a good growing season, um, we are in, in a positive position at this moment in time, but who knows what the winter will bring. So we are very um, open. We have been working with farmers uh, and preparing for the winter ahead. And I think that is a very key area of work, given the winter that we have just come through. Dr MacDonald, for supplementary, can I remind could, members, could, please, could, one could, question only. Could the, min sorry, could the minister confirm if all hardship payments have been made and if future payments or payments due shortly will be brought forward? Yes, um, the majority of hardship payments have uh, been paid. There are a very, very small number, I'm talking single um, figures, who for um, some technical reasons or bank reasons um, haven't been paid, but the majority, I'd say it's 99.9 per .9 cent, has, has been paid to date. And in terms of um, getting supports out to farmers, I was um, happy yesterday to be able to announce because of the exchange rate. Um, uh, uh, advantage that we, we were able to, to avail of this year, we have now been able to add an extra £16 million onto the um, single farm payments for this year. So that is something that is real money in the, in the, in the pocket of, of the farmers, so something that is very much been welcomed. And it is my aim to get the maximum number of payments out in December. Could remind members, please, not to be talking unnecessarily and allow the Minister to answer the questions. Can I call Mr Datty Mackay? The, the snow crisis, as the, the Minister mentioned, affected much of the north, uh, and in particular my own constituency uh, of North Antrim uh, at, at the start of the year. Now, at that time, the Department provided a lot of support, which was appreciated, and also some Irish and British uh, helicopter support as well. And now that some time has elapsed, uh, can the Minister confirm how much that support has cost us? 
Yes, as, as the member has rightly said, um, during the heavy snow, we needed, uh, very much needed, the, the assistance of both the British Ministry of Defence and the Irish Air Corps. And at my request, they did come in and provide that helicopter support, which allowed us to get that much needed um, fodder into, into hills and into very hard to reach areas. Um, and I'm pleased you know, that they were very, both um, uh, quite happy to come forward with that support. Um, at this moment in time, I am pleased to confirm that the, the Irish Government have said that they are not going to ask for any um, reimbursement for the, the cost of their helicopters. However, we do have in, in receipt in the Department a bill in the region of um, £640,000 from the British MOD. Call Mr Mackay for a supplementary. Fair enough, I get uh, Alaska and Coyer, and I think uh, that is a significant cost to the, the, the DARD budget. Can I, can I ask the Minister, uh, given that the British MOD do charge uh, in such circumstances, which he can consider for future planning, uh, only a veiling of resources uh, where costs are waived, uh, especially in humanitarian uh, circumstances such as this? Well, I mean, I think it's, it's, I mean, it was an emergency situation. The use of the helicopters was an absolute must and something that um, was very positively welcomed by, by the farming community. And you know, it was a necessary uh, lifeline to, to be able to get feed to livestock. I think, obviously, the fact um, helicopters run the helicopter costs money. But um, given the fact that we have um, a bill now uh, in the department for £640,000, is something that would make you think in future if you did need support where you would look for, for, for that help. So that's something that um, I'm actually I'm happy to confirm to the member that I'm actually challenging that with the British MOD. I have written to, uh, written to them and asked them to waive it, given the fact that it was uh, a difficult situation, it was an emergency situation. And in future, if we ever find ourselves in that situation, and, and hopefully we won't, but if we um, happen to find ourselves in that situation again, obviously cost would be a factor in um, what services we would deploy. Well, Mr Declan McAleer. Um, given that the British Government did not decide to seek additional EU funding for Pillar 2, what are the implications for the Levadin programme here? Well, I mean, I have always said, I have said repeatedly from the start that I have been disappointed that the British Government um, went to the negotiating table whenever it came to the overall EU budget with, with an, an, a negative view, with um, calling for a reduced, bu a reduced bu budget. That was something that was actually um, discussed in uh, Westminster, and um, parties in the opposite benches also agreed with that position. So um, to, to, to ask for that reduced budget, that, 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 being, a say, that being said, um, we, are sort of, we don't have a final settlement yet in terms of the rural development budget, but we are um, of the view that it will be a reduced budget, and we're facing a reduction of somewhere around about uh, I think it's about 22 per cent. So that, that's, that's an issue. That's, that's going to be an issue for us in the time ahead. And I suppose in terms of the implications for that, we need to be very effective about how we design our new programme, how we spend the reduced budget. Obviously, um, there are a number of needs in the industry, and we have environmental needs. We've got rural communities who have needs. So um, we need to be very effective about how we spend the, the new budget. Uh, and as I said earlier, um, we're out to consultation at this moment in time, and I really um, I want to hear views from as many people as possible who have had experience with the Rural Development Programme, who know the benefits of it, um, who know areas where things can be improved, and I'm happy to take a look at all of that in the round. Call Mr McAleer for a supplementary. Uh, 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 does the Minister, Minister envisage that under the new programme there will be rural community-based organisations which provide basic services that will be included in the new programme? Yes, I mean, I think the, the approach to date has been very good. I think the bottom-up approach that um, communities coming forward with the ideas that they have um, and uh, asking for supports for, for ideas that they have, I think, is the best way to do business. It's the best way to effectively spend the rural development programme. I mean, I welcome, in terms of moving forward, um, some of the priorities that the EU have identified, particularly around tackling poverty. Um, that's something that um, I'm very keen to make sure that we're able to bring something um, forward around that area. Also around um, new areas of support, particularly around R&D, so research, development and innovation funding is all um, very um, helpful, particularly if we're um, looking towards a more competitive and balanced food chain. So there are a number of areas that we need to be working on. Um, as I said, the consultation is out at this moment in time, and I want to hear the views. I think that there are a number of excellent successes um, that, that we can point to, particularly in terms of the strategic projects. There have been some excellent projects, I think, that I have visited, um, over, particularly over the summer, when I have had a chance to get, to get out and about. If we are serious about um, sustaining rural communities, about creating thriving rural communities, then the Rural Development Programme has to deliver for that rural community in its entirety. Call Ms. Bromland-McGann. 
Gourley, uh, can I ask the Minister how successful was our recent trip to China? Yes, um, I, mean, I just returned on um, Saturday evening. I was there last week. I was there at the invitation of um, the Chinese People's Association for Friendship with Foreign Countries. And I, it was a very effective visit. I was guest speaker at the fourth Sino uh, Euro Agricultural Conference, and that was my primary reason for the visit. But also, um, when I was there, I took the opportunity to secure meetings with those in government that are charged with processing export certificates. Um, and particularly in relation to pork, that was um, obviously something that was very, very, very important that we were able to get that meeting. And also it afforded me the opportunity to uh, enhance the links that we've already created um, with China. So um, a very useful visit, I have to say. Ms McGatton for a supplementary. Gura I thank the Minister for her response. Can I ask the Minister, does she think that these trips and the context that she makes while there are useful? Yes, ab absolutely I do. I mean, at the recent Balmoral show, um, one of the things that industry are calling for is that the executive actually get, get involved in these trips, that they're actually going out, that we're seeking business, that we're building relationships, that we're enhancing relationships that, that currently exist. And for me, this, this trip was, was another part of that. Um, we were very, I think one of the most successful things or, or uh, aspects to the trip was the fact that um, the Chinese government are now going to prioritise our export certificate um, for pork, and that's something that the pork industry are, have been calling for. So for me, that's been um, a, a very much an effective uh, outcome to, to the trip. Also, as part of the keynote um, speech, which was um, over 100 delegates from right across Europe, so we were able to make relations um, across Europe, but also with the, the, the Chinese um, government themselves. And I was able to um, very clearly put out the message that we have high standards of traceability, that um, we have um, fantastic food safety, that we've got wholesomeness of, of our agri-food industry. So um, to me, that, that was all very beneficial. And as I said, that also helped us to build on the links that um, OFMDFM um, commenced last year on the visit to China. So the Chinese um, are very much uh, into the, to, to building relationships. They're very much into um, enhancing relationships, and that's how they do business, and that's how we're going to get into that market. Mr. Jonathan Craig is not in his place. Call Mr. Joe Byrne. Yes, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Can I ask the Minister what are the ramifications for the agricultural community if 50% upfront? Uh, grants can be got under the single farm payment in October. And what can be done to try and rectify this problem? Uh, the members referring to, to part payments, and um, I've said previously in this House, and I've said it to, to the Ard Committee, um, my objective is to finalise and to pay as many single farm payments as we possibly can in December. Last year, um, we paid over 82% in December. This year, I want to uh, equal that, but obviously increase it. Um, I recognise the importance of trying to get as much uh, or as big a payment out to farmers as, as quickly as possible, and I want to be in a position to make advance payments in the future. Um, unfortunately, we're not at that position in time because of the difficulties that we've had with Europe around our mapping system, and that was where the priority uh, work has been over the last wee while. But we have made improvements which will allow us to get to the position as quickly as possible um, to make those advance payments, particularly around remote sensing, so increasing the number of inspections that are carried out by remote sensing. We went from 250 last year to 1140 this year, so that's quite, quite an improvement. Um, we're also encouraging more online applications, which allows us to process applications quickly. So I think a combination of all those um, efforts will, will get us to the position where, as quickly as possible, we are able to make advance payments. But I can assure the member that my priority for this year is to get the maximum number and the maximum amount of uh, money out into the farmer's pocket by December. Mr Byrne for a supplement. Well, Chairman, or Mr. Speaker, can I ask the Minister, is she content that the officials are doing everything in their power to make sure that this mapping problem can be solved? Yeah, I'm content that I am putting enough pressure on them to make sure that I want to have this mapping um, system completely um, up to speed, up to scratch, acceptable to Europe. I'm content that, um, that I'm doing my role in terms of making sure that, that pressure is applied. I'm content that they're working very hard, that this is a massive, massive piece of work. Remapping 750,000 fields is, is a very large piece of work, and I think we have to accept that. We have made progress. There is uh, more of a way to go. Uh, the department continues to work with land and property services, obviously, and on field parcels, and we're working our way through that, and I think you will see even more improved maps this year. And when, we, when our maps are right, when we increase, continue to increase the number of um, inspections by remote control sensing, when we have more people coming forward with online applications, we'll be in a, in a position very quickly, I believe, to bring forward advanced payments. 
that ends the topical questions. We move on now uh, to the oral questions. Can I tell members that questions 2, 11 and 15 have been withdrawn? I call Mr Paul Girvin. Uh, question number one, Minister. Yes, I am now confident that I have in place a mapping system that first and foremost is compliant with the regulatory requirements of the European Commission in regard to providing a maximum, maximum eligible area for each field parcel. More detailed work is now underway on some key areas requiring attention, such as the mapping of common land parcels and the updating of older author um, photography. Early difficulties with missing fields have been resolved, though it is always the case that there can be individual cases where inaccuracies um, have to be resolved. It remains the responsibility of the claimant to bring these inaccuracies or other changes to the department's attention. A significant update to maps will occur at the beginning of 2014, but it will always be important for farmers to remain vigilant, to check their maps and ensure that they are updated. I have always said that I think this is a two-way partnership between the department and the farmer. Thank the Minister for her answer, uh, but uh, just in relation to that, does that mean that payments can and will be processed and out uh, anyway early if uh, this process has been successful? Because we are aware that uh, in the past it has been uh, dragged on some time before some, some uh, farmers have received their single farm payment. Yeah. As I said earlier, my intention is to make sure we pay out the maximum amount of money and um, and pay the, the maximum amount, number of farmers in December. That's, that's the target for this year. Um, as I said earlier, I mean, there's a lot of work going on within the department, particularly around the map and exercise and making sure that that's um, fit for purpose and, and appropriate and acceptable to Europe. We've made a lot of progress in that regard. But my priority for this year is about getting the payments out as early as possible. We made 82% with, um, well within the target for December for last year. Um, however, this year, I'd like to go even further. I'd like to have more money out and more farmers paid in October or in, de in December. Call Mr. Declan McAleer. Um, could the minister just elaborate slightly further on her uh, on the single farm payment and the claims? Well, 98.6% um, of the 37,585 single farm payment claims submitted in 2012 were finalised by the 30th of June. Last year, a total of 243.4 million had been paid out, and that was 99% um, of the total estimated value of the um, 2012 claims. The Commission requirement to pay at least 95.24% of the 2012 budget by the 30th of June was met in early April 2013. I intend to publish the payment timetable for this year in November, which will clearly set out the targets for this year, so the targets for December, January, February and right through. Um, as I said earlier, my aim is to pay the maximum number of farmers uh, the maximum amount of money as quickly as possible in December and improve on the percentage that we achieved last year. Call Mr. Fran McCann. Question two or question three. I'm concerned about the impact of rising fuel costs, particularly on the vulnerable in rural areas who are limited in the choice of fuel that they can have that they can avail of and do not have access to cheaper alternatives such as mains gas. Addressing fuel poverty is therefore a key objective within the financial poverty priority area for intervention. That is um, detailed in Dar DARD's Tackle on Rural Poverty and Social Isolation Framework. The Warm Home Scheme is DSD and Government's primary tool in tackling fuel poverty. My department has collaborated effectively with DSD in the past, providing supplementary funding to the Warm Home Scheme, ensuring that many vulnerable rural households, who would otherwise um, would not have been supported, received much needed home energy efficiency measures such as insulation, central heating systems. I am committed to continuing this support for the incoming winter. My department has also provided supplementary funding support to the Power NI free insulation scheme that also installs insulation packages to low income rural households. I remain committed to tackling action or to take an action to uh, address the challenges facing people living in rural areas and also to improve on their quality of life and will continue to work with key stakeholders to ensure that action is taken to target fuel poverty in rural areas. Mr. McCann for supplementary. And, uh, I thank the Minister for her question thus far, but can she provide more detail on the outcomes of her work on tackling fuel poverty in rural areas? I think we have been very successful in, in the work that has been done to date under the um, previous anti-poverty framework. 
In 0809, 700 um, rural homes received home insulation and central heating systems through DARD, um, providing 380,000 of top-up to the DSD Warm Home Scheme, um, which ensured that 3 million of DSD spend that otherwise wouldn't have occurred. During 2009 and 10, then DARD collaborated with DSD and NIE Energy, providing 250,000 to fund the installation of 300 low-income rural homes that could not be supported through the Warm Home Scheme. During 2010-11, um, DARD worked with DSD and the Warm Home Scheme implementation agents to assist the targeting of um, hard-to-reach rural dwellers. DARD also increased the number of rural referrals to the DSD Warm Homes and Installation Schemes through the Maximising Access to Grants, Benefits and Services project. Built on the success of the previous um, anti-poverty framework, DARD provided 23,000 of top-up to DSD Warm Homes Plus Scheme, grant for four hard-to-treat rural properties in 11-12 through the current um, Tackling Poverty Framework. DART also provided 390,000 in 11-12 to supplement the Power NA Free Installation Scheme, which was also supported through uh, the Sustainable Energy Programme. DART funding resulted in uh, an extra 578 vulnerable dwellers um, benefiting from the Loft and Cavity Wall Installation Scheme. Last year, then, DART provided 224,000 again to supplement the Power NA Free Installation Scheme and that intervention resulted in an extra 323 vulnerable rural dwellers benefiting from, from that scheme. So it has been a lot of positive work, and I want to continue to do more of that in the future. Mr Gregory Campbell. Mr. Speaker, uh, the Warm Home Scheme is an excellent scheme. Many people have benefited from it. But would the Minister outline what she is doing in terms of the supplementary assistance to, to the scheme to ensure that knowledge of the scheme and access into it, particularly in areas that do not get broadband access in, in rural areas, that they can have knowledge of the scheme and then access into it? I think that's, that's a very valid idea. If people don't know about it, they can't benefit from it. So, um, for me, the, the benefit from uh, the additional money, it's nearly been uh, leverage money. We're able to attract more money from DSD because DART are putting forward something to enhance the scheme that they have. Plus, also in rural areas, the cost of insulating a, a rural home, maybe with a solid wall, is just um, the, the, the age of the, of the property. It usually costs more than the maximum level that um, DSD can provide, of 6,500. So, for me, that, it's a key area of support. It's a necessary area of support. Well, I certainly take a look at how we're advertising it and how we're getting that message out because I think that is um, very key. I know that we use uh, rural community centres, doctors, GP surgeries um, and a range of other issues, but I'm happy to take a look again to make sure that we are effectively getting that message out. Mr David McNair. Speaker, the Minister says she's concerned about uh, fuel poverty and I don't doubt her. Uh, why then is the Minister taking an ideological stand in something which could really ease fuel property for all of us in Northern Ireland, namely fracking? Uh, and, and is this an indication that you actually would be more content to release develop, uh, departmental land for wind turbines? Well, I think I mean, it's fair to say that the process of fracking hasn't been pro proven to be safe, and unless the member has information to suggest otherwise, he should, actually, he should come forward with that. There is considerable potential on uh, what I have said this week in the media is that there is considerable potential on um, dard lands for sustainable, for environmental um, benefits, to look at renewables. I am totally committed to looking at all of those things and assisting rural communities where possible in terms of the add-on benefit that, that can give to rural communities. Fracking poses, in my opinion, fracking poses, in my opinion, it is my opinion that counts. In my opinion, fracking ca causes a real risk, a real risk to the farming communities, to rural communities. So that is something that, that I, I um, am I'm going to make sure that um, that's the ethos that will be carried through in my term in the department. If fracking would, were to go ahead in any part of this island, I think it will cause international reputational damage to Ireland as a whole, to our environmental practices, to the clean green image that we have. So that's the position I've adopted. Whatever you feel about fracking, I'm not happy about people shouting from sedentary positions. I call Mr David Hildage. Question four, David Speaker. By the 25th September of this year, inspectors had visited 887 sites and found only nine uh, new cases of Clara infection. Together with the 77 cases found during 2012, 86 sites have been declared infected. In all cases, the source of infection was young trees planted since 2006. Scientists advise that there is significant risk that the disease may spread from young ash trees to older trees and hedgerows by the release of spores from infected leaves that have fallen to the ground. 
Although inspectors found that only a small proportion of trees showed symptoms, they ordered the destruction of over 70,000 associated young planted trees and leaf debris because the disease may be present without obvious symptoms. Scientists also advise that once the disease begins circulating in the wider environment by the release of spores, then control will become very difficult. Affected ash trees were also destroyed at three trade premises. In July this year, I launched uh, jointly with the All-Ireland um, Clara Control Strategy with Minister Tom Hayes in Dublin. The strategy provides a framework for the implementation of our policy of identification, control and eradication of the casual agents of Clara ash dieback. The European Standing Committee on Plant Health is considering the legislative action that has been taken by us, by the South and by Britain, and have asked us to show that our control programme is effective and that we, can make, um, and we, we make an application for protected zone status against this disease. Consequently, we will um, we'll continue our surveillance into the autumn until after leaf fall because scientific understanding suggests that the conditions for spread in the wider environment probably exist in the island of Ireland. Call Mr. Hildes for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I appreciate the answers from the Minister. Minister, it was established that the supplier of the diseased trees to forestry projects in Northern Ireland was traced to a certain premises in the Irish Republic. Has any action been taken against this premises or even legal advice sought? It would not be for me for to comment on, on, on that. As I said, I think the biggest risk to trade, the biggest risk to us in terms of ash dieback is, is via trade. Um, right across Europe, there are no barriers to trade, but we are looking actively um, at this moment in time at um, bringing forward statutory pre-notification. I intend to talk to our committee about that um, over the next number of weeks, because we do need to look at um, what are the potential risks, and some of the potential risks are around four particular species, and that's the area that, that we're concentrating on for um, the pre-notification status, and that's around ash, oak, um, sweet chestnut, and plane trees. So there, there are the areas that we need to be looking at. In terms of um, my approach, my approach has very much been an all-island approach because we are a one island. We need to cooperate together. In terms of um, Britain and, the, and the, the efforts that they have um, been involved with, they were at a very different disease stage than us. It wouldn't even have made any sense to um, just do what Britain are doing. You have to look at um, plant health, same as animal health, on an all-island basis in terms of trade and in terms of benefits to, to the island. So that's why I launched the all-island strategy with um, Minister Tom Hayes. The good thing about that strategy is that it um, can very easily be adapted to changing circumstances. So if we find ourselves um, with a change in disease risk, if we find ourselves in um, change in status in terms of the disease, then we're able to adapt that strategy. And I keep in regular contact with uh, Minister Hayes in regards to that. Well, Mr. Sean Rogers. Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for answers thus far. In terms of the All Island approach, could you detail what discussions you have had with the Minister of Agriculture, Mr. Simon Coveney, on this matter? In regards to plant health, with the way the system works in the Dáil, um, Minister Tom Hayes is, is the, um, the Minister who is responsible. However, and I, and I regularly engage with um, Mr. Hayes, and, and I have done so over the last number of months. Um, but in terms of conversations with Simon Coveney. We have discussed this at North South Ministerial Council level and it's an, obviously an issue that um, in terms of overall plant health but um, obviously currently because of ash dieback that is one of the, the main topics of conversation but we are actively working towards an all island plant and health um, strategy to have that because we're one epidemiological epi unit across the island and I think we need to work effectively together in terms of um, how if you look towards the past how the Fortress Iron approach has served us very well. Call Mr. Alistair Ross. I established a fodder task force in May to consider the issues facing the livestock industry in the following 12 months um, and to produce an action plan to mitigate the effects of any potential problems. The fodder task force brought together representatives of ancillary um, agri food industries, including feed suppliers and banks food processors, together with stakeholder organisations and um, DART officials. The task force members agreed an action plan in July that was published on the DART website and have been working together over the summer to implement it. They have met four times and although they do not intend to meet as a group again until midwinter, they will to get together in the interim if a situation develops and they are required to do so. I met with um, stakeholder organisations representing livestock farmers on the 18th of September to listen to their assessment of um, how well the farmers, they feel that farmers are prepared for the months ahead 
And it was good to hear that the favourable grass growing conditions during the summer, coupled with the advice that DARD have been involved in, in delivering, has ensured that farmers are um, obviously now better placed in terms of, the, the, um, of trying to mitigate and avoid the fodder situation in, in, in the winter ahead. There are still actions that farmers can take to plan for the winter, and DARD will continue to provide advice and support to ensure that they are well prepared. A comprehensive programme of workshops, um, advisory events and publications will be produced by CAFRI to help farmers stock take their individual um, fodder supplies and also to make um, the most efficient use of the fodder that is available. In the longer term, I am um, actively considering the potential of a land improvement scheme. And I believe that this joint approach by both government and the agri-food industry to take responsibility and deal collectively with the problems that are facing the industry is the most effective approach to ensure that another fodder crisis is averted in the winter ahead. I call Mr Ross for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Does the Minister agree with me that um, the success of the scheme was largely down to a number of uh, haulage contractors who imported feed into Northern Ireland? And will she ensure that any outstanding money is paid to those contractors without any further delay? I fully agree that um, the success of the scheme was because it was a partnership approach, because um, uh, the stakeholders all came together and we were able to um, establish the task force itself. But um, I'm assured that, um, again, very close to 100 per cent of um, hauliers have all been paid. Anybody that's outstanding, it's, um, their um, issues are being uh, worked through with the department, and um, obviously we'd want to get them paid as quickly as possible for the service, that the vital service that they did provide uh, over the last number of months. Call Mr. Cahill Boylan. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and the Minister for answer. But could the Minister indicate to the House what organisations are represented on the task force? And again, the, the success of, of the task force has been the fact that it's been all the key players that have come together. We've had the banks, we've had the Ulster Farmers Union, we've had NIAPA, we've had the Grain Trade Association, uh, Meat uh, Exporters Association, Dairy UK, NIFTA. Um, rural support, because, and I think that's key, and I've talked about that in the House before, this has been such a difficult time for the farming industry. We need to put a lot of um, emphasis on the fact that farmers need a lot of emotional uh, and support, so rural support have been key, and we're very delighted that they were also at the table and part of the, discuss the discussions around what assistance they can provide to, to rural communities who, and, and to farmers who are um, struggling maybe financially and practically because of all, all the problems that have been presented to them over the last, I suppose, 18 to 24 months. Dolores Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I wonder if the Minister could indicate whether or not she has given any consideration uh, to examining the amount of land that is in public or indeed private ownership that might actually be able to be used as fodder. I mean, I'm sure, uh, like myself, she has noted huge swathes of land uh, which has gone to waste over many years, and whether or not that is an issue she could actually bring to the attention of the fodder task force for some innovative thinking on the matter task force um, came up with, but yes, I think it is an innovative way to look at things, and I think that, uh, or I'm very happy to, to, to relay that back to the task force. I mean, we should be looking at all, I mean, we wouldn't see any wastage, and if, if we can make hay when the sun shines, then that's what we should, should be doing. <laughs> oh, Mr. Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, can I ask the Minister to set out her reasons for deciding against extending the fertiliser season beyond the 15th of September as a way to increase fodder stocks, unlike uh, her counterparts in the Republic? Well, we have two very different um, nitrates action plans in place, and ours is actually a lot more generous all year round, so that's the distinct difference between what the South are doing and, and, and what we can do. Ultimately, it is a DOE decision. That being said, it's something that both myself and the Department of Environment um, discuss. And there isn't the evidence to suggest that there's enough financial benefit for extending the period that a, that a farmer would get enough um, for the cost that it would, uh, it would um, bring to him to spread, that he would get enough growth out of it. So we very much take decisions based on scientific evidence, and the fact is the scientific evidence wasn't there to support it. It actually re would have affected a relatively small number of farmers, even if we were able to extend the date. But as I said, I'll base the decisions on, on the evidence, and the evidence suggests that there would be no real economic benefit for the farmer. Members, uh, number six, the member indicated he wished to withdraw it because it was covered in topical questions, but I must remind members the questions must be withdrawn by 12 o'clock, so for the record, the member is not in his place. Uh, the next question, seven, uh, Jim Wells is not in his place, but I assure members, sorry, order please, I assure members there's a perfectly good reason for it. Thank you. 
I call Ms. Pam Brown. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question number eight. Antibiotics have been widely used in uh, the livestock and poultry industries across the globe since their discovery more than 50 years ago. They are an important tool in treating animal diseases and thereby um, aiding in the production of animal products such as milk and meat and eggs. It is important, however, that farmers use antibiotics only when they are needed and that they keep good records of all antibiotics used and the identity of animals treated and that they abide by the recommended withdrawal periods. This, of course, applies to the use of all veterinary medicines. My department, along with the Department of Health, Social Services and Public Safety, is responsible for implementing controls on the use of veterinary medicines, including residue um, surveillance and inspection of establishments producing and marketing animal feeds and feed ingredients. The department is funding a three-year Agri-Food and Biosciences Institute research project into the use of um, antimicrobials, which coincidentally is actually beginning today. The project will provide an increased understanding of the issues surrounding um, antimicrobial um, resistance and the current use of veterinary um, antimicrobials here. In collaboration with DEFRA, the devolved administrations and the Department of Health, Social Services and Public Safety um, recently endorsed the five-year uh, resistance strategy which was published last month. The strategy aims to improve the knowledge and the understanding of resistance, conserve and uh, steward the effectiveness of existing treatments and stimulate the development of new antibiotics, diagnostics and novel therapies. My officials are currently considering the Associated Action Plan. Call Ms Brown for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer. Um, the Minister will be aware, obviously, of the public concern uh, with regard to antibiotics um, given to animals who are in the food chain. Um, but can the Minister um, indicate if she is aware of any instance where antibiotics have been added at low doses to the feed of otherwise healthy animals to control growth and disease? It's not an issue that's on my desk, but I absolutely agree with your first point around um, concerns. I think there is a consumer confidence issue. Um, people want to be assured that what they're eating, that there's been very tight controls, that they know exactly what they're getting. And I think given um, the recent issues around horse meat, and, you know, that further is not confidence in our supply chain. So um, whilst we have very effective traceability in place, and that includes in terms of managing um, anti antibiotics and, and their administration in animals, I mean, I think that um, farmers are very responsible. In the main, farmers are very responsible around their use of antibiotics. And I think that um, for me personally, I would like to see a more proactive approach to animal disease, animal health. So as opposed to just always treating sickness, to be looking at production diseases, which we have more of a, 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 an effort towards now around BVD. But I think that we very much need to be doing that. And we do need to be looking at um, making sure that there's, there's no um, underhand use of antibiotics. But if the members are aware of anything in particular, I would be very happy to talk to her outside of question time. Call Mr Raymond McCartney. Our question number nine, Little Hub. The LOX Agency was a key member of the steering committee for the Round the World Clipper Race in 2012 and has already offered its services to Derry Council in this respect for Clipper 2014. In um, 2012, surrounding the Clipper event, the agency provided uh, sailing taster sessions, facilitated the experience of sail for those who may not otherwise have that opportunity. Other activity included a full moon paddle by canoe along the River Foyle and a seafood festival. The LOX Agency is exploring opportunities to similarly uh, animate the foil with marine tourism activity during Clipper 2014 and the marine event platform or the pontoon that was constructed in 2012 through the agency's EU Interreg programme remains a key piece of infrastructure for the Clipper around the world race. Indeed, the Clipper organisers praised that facility as being the best they had um, they'd availed of anywhere on their voyages around the world. So I think that's something that's very positive and we can be pr very proud of. Mr. McCartney for supplementary. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Speaker, and I want to thank the Minister for her answer. Uh, I mean, obviously, everybody in Derry understands the importance of Clipper, indeed, and, and well the, the of the Clipper, indeed, and understand well the great work that the LOX Agency do. Can you outline any of our programmes which the LOX Agency will be rolling out in the next couple of years? Yeah, I mean, the LOX Agency very much um, are involved in, in looking at the whole tourism aspect and what they can do to promote tourism. Aquaculture is another area that um, they're very interested in, and, and, and I'm delighted to see that. I think we should be exploiting the natural resources that we have, and, and in Derry, obviously, that's um, something that's, that's very, um, very much valued. 
So they're involved in doing, uh, in doing a lot of, of, of that um, work, and they're also engaged with the, very much with the city of culture and any, any aspects that they can bring to, to, to make that even more of a success. And additionally, the, they had a key role in supporting um, the angling element to, to the World um, Police and Fire Games. So I think they've been very effective in, in, in engaging and sort of, um, I suppose, thinking outside the box and engaging with other agencies around how they can best promote um, the, the foil and, and, and the surrounding area. Call Mr. Fargill McKinney. Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, I meet regularly with Minister Coveney, both in the context of North South Ministerial Council and separately as necessary to discuss a range of issues, including matters um, that are relating to animal health on the island of Ireland. Under the North South Ministerial Council arrangements, there is a TB and brucellosis working group um, comprising of key veterinary and policy officials from um, right across the island. It meets two or three times a year to exchange um, information relevant to the control and the eradication of TB, including possible areas of cooperation. In addition, both um, my officials and Minister Coveney's officials are in regular contact discussing all aspects of bovine TB. My department has a rigorous EU Commission approved bovine TB eradication plan, which is vital in safeguarding our export um, dependent trade in livestock and livestock um, products, which is valued at over 1,000 million each year. And the South has similar EU Commission approval for their TB eradication plan. The TB herd and animal testing programmes right across the island comply with the EU Trade Directive. Call Mr. McKinney for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and the Minister for replies. Uh, could you tell the House, is the Minister and Dard committed to a joint north south approach to tackling bovine TB? Yes, I already have a strategy in place around the all island animal health and welfare strategy. So that's looking at the whole gambit of animal disease. Um, it's primarily aimed at looking at how we can remove all the barriers to trade, and disease is one of the biggest barriers that we have to trade. Um, we have that strategy in place. We have officials across the island actively working on it, and myself and Minister Coveney regularly engage in relation to it. We also have um, the upcoming <coughs> EU animal health and welfare law, which we would believe will give us the vehicle that would allow us to um, be able to facilitate free movement of cattle right across the island. And to me, the, the potential benefits for that are going to be phenomenal to, to the whole island industry as a whole, particularly as we're attempting to grow the industry. Call Mr. Tom Elliott. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. Um, just wondering, has the Minister or the Department given any consideration to changing the testing method, the on-farm testing method, uh, for cattle uh, to trace bovine TB? The member may or may not be aware that um, last year, or last year, last week, or maybe the 17th of September, it was that I uh, announced that I was going to establish a government industry partnership to look at the whole area of, of um, TB. And what, we said, what I said at that time was that um, I think we need to look at the whole, all the range of issues again. I mean, we have very effective going, uh, work um, ongoing with our TB eradication plan, we ha which is approved by Europe and also allows us to draw down um, four million in funding to help us eradicate TB. But we also now um, I'm going to take the strategic partnership to take a look at the, the entire issue. So look at, we need to look at compensation. We need to look at the eradication plan that we have in place. We need to look at um, the results of the TVR practices that we have going forward. So I'm um, very open-minded to look at everything again to make sure that we're doing everything we can. We want to be able to drive out this disease. We, we want to have a strategy in place. And I think we need to look at and be open-minded to look at all the aspects of it. And that includes compensation, as I said, at, at, um, looking at the badger, looking at all the issues that, that are there in, in regards to TB, because it is a very complex disease. There is no quick solution. There's no quick fix. But I think that um, strategically we have to look at it from, from that angle. Question 11 is withdrawn. I call Mr. Pat Sheehan. I'm going to ask Con Corla, question 12. My department's proposals for the next Rural Development Programme are currently out for public consultation and as part of this consultation we are seeking views on the options for a delivery of a future programme. The EU proposals for um, rural development require a minimum of 5% to be delivered using the leader approach. While seven local action groups were established in the current programme, the review of public administration will mean that the leader local action groups will be reformed in line with the new council areas and boundaries. There would still be an option to cluster councils together in line with the new boundaries if it was felt that fewer than 11 local action groups would be more cost effective, easier to administer and there might be greater impact of the funds in the combined area. But as I said earlier, these are some of the areas that um, are out of consultation at this moment in time and I'm seeking views. 
My department's not transferring any functions to councils as a result of the RPA. However, I am considering how local government will be involved in the next programme, both through the leader approach and directly with my department. Order. Uh, that concludes questions to the Minister for Agriculture. Uh, point of order. I apologise for not being in my place for DSD questions. I was in another meeting and I got to the back door when I heard that I was in my place, so I thought it better not to come in and, and um, that in, in late. So I do apologise to the House and indeed to the Minister for, for missing the question.